also a traditional thing, the end of warfare. Whereas warfare is the worst of all crimes in that it embodies, encourages, and rewards all others. Whereas the definition of war as used as the Nuremberg trials is meet for the purposes of this proposition. Therefore, we, the party of the first part, all citizens of any nation, all those who suffer from the effects and privations of war, who oppose it as a system, as a behavior, as a socially accepted institution, call for an end to war, cessation of all hostilities, the standing down of all military forces, and universal disarmament. Further, let it be known, we the people, the party of the first part, state by our assertion at this time and place that we stand opposed to the existence or use of military force as we now know it. All those in favor of Proposition 1, please signify. It looks like it carries. All those opposed? Abstentions? Abstention. One abstention. Thank you. So, if you want to be in the loop, you can... Oh, that's, you, already, you already read that part. Oh, I did? Yes, All right. Because well, that's in the case, other one, too. Let's play ball. Play ball! Play ball. Uh, the Curse of Ryder will please come oh. forward. Uh, damn. Oh. What? No. Nothing. <laughs> Something left out. I just got so carried away. So carried away. There we go. Oh yeah, I can move these out of your way. We don't need those there. Oh, you're over. Yeah, you're ready. Oh, man. Entre vous, s'il vous plaît. Stehen Sie auf. Sprechen Sie auf. Hören Sie zu, wiederholen Sie. That's about it. All right, I'm going to do, uh, I'm doing uh, two poems, one by John Trudell and one by D. Allen. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, John Trudell is called uh, Shaman Make a Chant. Shaman gonna make a chant, a chant, a chant. Healing in a song, a song, a song. Shaman gonna make a chant, a chant, a chant. See who you are, you are, you are. Shaman gonna make a chant, a chant. Listen to your heart, your heart, your heart. Shaman gonna make a chant, a chant, a chant. Share to care, to care, to care. Shaman gonna make a chant, a chant. Natural to be free, be free, be free. Shaman gonna make a chant, a chant. Always do your best, your best, your best. Peace swirled through thought consciousness, only way to live. Peace, man, woman, brother, sister, remember caring, loving. Peace, people leading kind lives. Leaders aren't leaders. People are. People embrace obligations to truth. Give each generation strong hoops. Peace, our relations, all of life. Harmony in all living things. Peace, proclamation not enough. Our responsibility in, in, emancipates the earth. Peace, our balanced channel, our flow, determination in human energy, peace, past is current to future, we are stronger than we appear, peace, war maker so far out of balance, he can't help but fall, peace, we come from the beginning, the world with no end, life. Shaman gonna make a chant, a chant, a chant. Kindness, a good word, a good word, good word. Shaman gonna make a chant, make a chant, a chant. Open up your mind, your mind, your mind. Shaman gonna make a chant, a chant. Brothers, sisters will unite, unite, unite. Shaman gonna make a chant, a chant. Harmony on earth, on earth, on earth. 
Shaman gonna make a chant, a chant. Shaman gonna make a chant, a chant. Peace, no war, no war. Shaman gonna make a chant. Yeah. That was by John Trudell. Um, this is by D. Allen. Uh, I went to the um, opening of um, The City Is Already Speaking, and this was a piece he has in there. And I think you'll know what he's talking about. For Mary Jean Robinson, Kim Shuck, and Patrick Flanahan, Flanagan. San Francisco's Civic Center, the Eastern Quadrant, has a future. And it will resemble an iron post jutting out of, from asphalt like a dense stalk holding up. An iron sculpted flat litany of California's early days, before, after, settlement by the other. Nobody's visions could miss thorny green flora won't dare cover this up, and it will supplant. Rich boy James Lick's gift to the emerging West Coast city, all 800 tons. Reenactment in bronze, monument of victory that made native eyes weep in centuries long streets. And they will be abandoned, a Spanish cowboy raising his vainglorious fist, a Catholic monk pointing his sanctimonious fingers to heaven, supremacy flexed on the stretched out a lonely man swaddled in his blanket, a foreign god growing numbers muscle out his future. What a home invasion looked like back in the early days. Not all racist statues are Confederate ones. Thank you. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. And now, Mr. Champion, kindly come forward. Give him a round of our first open mic. We got Jennifer, Britt, Jared, Kenny, Owen, Natalie, Tommy, Marjorie Morningstar. Morningstar? I'm just joking. Oh, okay. This one's called La Pistola. A shot rang out. Mama and big sister herded the kids to safety. I headed for the door. Ricardo, behind the couch. Young boy ran out and returned with Abuelita. Gray hair, black dress, and a cane that served for seeing as well as walking. Felix, you're in trouble. Mama, David is the one who pulled the trigger. David is in there with you? You two always were worse together. You should have had better sense by now. It wasn't my fault. We wanted to look at the new pistola. Mama guided Abuelita still scolding, waving the pistols, not quite aware of the trigger, potentially more of a danger to the family than Thales and David, David, either separately or together. Mama carried the pistol like a dead rat to eldest son who disemboweled it. No, Felix, you can't have your pistol or the bullets. Felix disappeared into the back room. David got out the front door without a word. Mama called everyone out of hiding. 
The priest's nephew, about 16, proudly carried a pistola. He came to the picnic and placed the pistola in my hand, already shaken by tequila and mezcal. Before I could fire, my guardian angel slipped the pistola from my hand back to the nephews. Thank you, God. My cattle number one in complete cowboy outfit, including holster and pistola, was riding his horse to the ranch. Why the pistola, I asked. A dispute over who owns the rancho. Soon I noticed Vaquero Numero Dos, same attire, riding his horse, same direction. Same ranch, my informant said, same dispute, cousins. Mexico was sending north people who wanted to work. The U.S. was sending arms south to people who wanted to do damage. I came into the Mexico City airport in the pre-dawn hours. I had the bad luck of being red light buzzed as I came through customs. The young woman was wearing what appeared to be a Girl Scout uniform with a cap and gold braid. She didn't like the pre-dawn hours any better than I did. A glance at my backpack. Just closed, she asked. Yes, she waved me on. At the fiesta, I asked my host about vaqueros numero uno and numero dos. No, he whispered. Why? We could get into big trouble. Why? The government has taken away our guns. All of them? Yes. I thought there was something there that we in the U.S. could learn. Lee was emphatic. You have a son now. Dick was in retreat. He carried me to the front seat of the car. Don't come back until you've taken care of this. It was an order. Pointing to his souvenirs, Dick said firmly, don't touch those. Fat chance. Dick par parked the car at the police station. Don't touch those. Bigger fat chance. He disappeared for a short time. When he returned, I was playing with the souvenirs. He gathered them up and took them inside. Machine gun bullets, gone. Lee let him come home. No matter where he had tried to hide them, I would have found them. Aunt Marie was disgusted in her Texas way. Can you believe that so many damn fools want to play soldier boy out there in the piney woods? They stay out all night with the skeeters. Marie didn't mention the snakes, but I knew the piney woods. If they like guns so much, they can join the Houston police force, get killed just about any Saturday night. Texas cousin was out with her girlfriends on Saturday night. Don't worry about him, girls. I have a gun. Bang. Houston police showed up. The polite officer commented, Ma'am, I'm glad you can protect yourself and your friends. Next time, take your gun out of your purse before you fire it. <laughs> Like my Texas cousins, I'm armed. I take care of bullies, pickpockets, and would-be robbers. Among my weapons are loud voice, fleetness of foot, 
and common sense. I survived a felon with a big knife who never should have been let out of San Quentin. Adrenaline helped. Resourcefulness is also beneficial. One night late, the store was empty except for the clerk and I. Two guys, hi, working up courage to take money that wasn't there, backed in with no escape. I gathered cans of peaches, a jug of organic apple juice, planning to turn them into weapons. With surprise, I might be able to take down one. I hoped the clerk could take down the other. Hungry hippies came in. Robbers disappeared down the street, still calling, pack and eat. I replaced the jug of organic apple juice and the cans of peaches. I went home without my late night munching. I'm reminded of Bogart's comment. So many guns, so few brains. Duper. Give him a round of applause. Up. So we got um, Rick, the generic Owen, Natalie, Tommy, Marjorie. Looks like Mar Marjorie. Is that right? Mar Maybe, huh? Mar Marjorie. 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 Okay. Thank you. Sorry. This is called a pretty day. A nice day today. Nobody does anything in relaxed sunlight. That's my little high food. <clears throat> okay. As she's going to work this morning. This is called the Speedway to San Jose. Mm -hmm. On the Speedway, people commute to work. The ozone layer gone, so they feel no obligation to drive less, if at all. Step on the gas, and they're off. The speedway gives so much back. The adrenaline in their hearts alive with magnificence. On the freeway now, my bus carries 10 times the no number of people riding in the polluting car. On the speedway, I ride anything but alone. <laughs> Mr. Buford Bunton. Haiku and other arranged thoughts. Uh, who's next? Oh, Britt Peter, give him a round, please. <laughs> The wonderful Brit Peter, as I might call him. The theme I hear is roller skates. Thank you. My imaginary dog loves his roller skates, all four of them. He whips through the neighborhood shouting, dog power, dog power, Trump must go. Out of the way, Snoopy. I'm a roller derby champ. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Roller skates, Mark Twain's essays, Life as I Find It, a hell of a book. Roller skates, short flights, falling on your butt. Life as I Find It, roller skates, short flights, falling on your butt, more than once. Oh, I remember that, a hard lesson. Right. Honest indignation. They say that William Blake saw God through the window when he was seven. This morning he saw Trump on TV. Kate, turn it off. Stepped away from the lithography pad and said, a last judgment is necessary because fools flourish. <laughs> yeah. 
This is from my home valley, Indian Valley years. My dad told me of a pocket valley below the ledges of near mountains, taking stock to high grazing with his dad, hearing familiar sounds riding up from the home ranch up to Kettle Rock, their camp, 1920. This older man fought back tears as he told his stories as a sweet sickness touched him yet again, the traveling sound, the echoes. Now in these later years, no more first-hand stories. Everything carried through summation, snapshots, and this. A notice for the Round Valley powwow. 3,000 years of culture tucked away before Peter Lassen, before Job Taylor's grindstone, ancient and continuing playgrounds, soft rhythmic pounding against the known ground to hear time, rushing water, and feathered calls. And if I've got the time, I've got one more Indian Valley point. The North Arm of Indian Valley, 1908. Placer tailings near the road, ranch houses on the bank, hillsides above flooding, the sliding slabs of lumber of other lodgings in the North Arm, the sharp edges of the mountain shell, the unity of sky and earth, the smell of sage burning, continual habitation in this corner place many years. Thank you. Oh. Mr. Britt Peter. <laughs> the generic game face. All right. Okay. But he's going by that now. All right. Oh, is, is Peter going to come after you or before you when you're doing Before me. Okay, all right, because it looked like it was after, but I wanted to be sure. I figured it was before. Before. Yeah. All right. All right. Generic game face. I just thought that was, never mind. It was. All right, now this is not working. Hold on one sec. I'm holding. I'm in a holding pattern. Was the game working? It's a very obscure uh, piece of music, by the way. And, uh, okay, it's by it's by Mazorsky, so it'll either come on or it will not. It's very quiet at the beginning. All right. Okay. Yes. No. That comes my. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna turn this so it catches. Oh, I oh, yeah. see. Oh, that's, that's right. Why okay. That's why. All right. All right. Here I am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here I am. There you go. You're beautiful. <laughs> All right. Well. A tide walks back across its low, damp Sahara. The mine covers and uncovers. Its rivers flood or vanish with separate understanding. Fear of Cape Kawanda keeps me hungry. Its sand attacked by the sea. I am a dreamer whose gaze is drawn to dead whales, but whose inner ear is attuned to drag racing. Rare the contentment that will copy itself on a low tide strand of remembering. Listen and know that the greater the attention span, the greater the worry and vulnerability, the nearer the awful onset of confinement and thinking one's way into knowledge, knowledge that is just merely frozen action take something to a logical conclusion to experience the opposite of an animal's power. Think it through to the end, and it will be far too late to have ever been very good or very bad. <coughs> Only a pawn should resemble a pond. There are reasons a squirrel is squirrelish, reasons the fox is so obviously alive. It is impossible to tell the idle from the thoughtful, even in Tibet. So Nepenthe in the damp deserts of seacoast alone, 
Only that sweet uncertainty will do when mysterious breakers give birth to obsessions and salt dries the tongue and makes it the target for a fish bone's benevolent acupuncture, touching all the secret sense of one's nature, where worry is like a ring that goes from light metals to heavy with each alchemical hour. It isn't necessary to work it all out. It's only necessary to know disaster waiting for your case to come up in a judged pound gavel and release the adrenaline of court, like an unseen flooding from unseen cells. As if there's shelter anywhere anyway, a place to be apart and excise oneself, to cancel without suicide the sights of human progress. The ways we have of getting better when what's supposed to improve is so damn imperfect, it can only get better at being flawed. A hideaway, as if in the bowers of surviving Bay Laurel, the muscles of the state will not be exercised. As if there is an abandoned silver mine, Dan, left over from the Lone Ranger's yesteryear, capable of making someone a millionaire of Brahmin isolation, safe in safety from the clockwork inevitable and the tumbler action of other safes in combination in the city. The blind-siding blind that live in five-sided structures. And feeling good enough to climb certain canyons inside of machines Yet you know that the universe will follow to any sanctuary given tunnel under monasteries with medieval cunning to crumple the parapets and after a while the monk until all is made even and no one an island, just a foolish finale. I'm not a foolish finale. But that was, I was going to tell you about the Permian extinction where 95% of the life on the planet was destroyed 250 million years ago, but there's no time. <laughs> Thank you. Steve Arson, or as we like to call the generic game face, uh, Mr. Owen Dunkel is next. And then we have uh, Natalie, Tommy, Marguerite. Did I say it right? Okay, thank you. And then uh, me, Clyde Always, and then um, the Curse of Brighter for for Peter, and then our teacher, who is in the house, as we like to say it. Thank you so much. Oh, move, move the microphone this way. Sorry. Yeah, that's yeah, that way it'll, it'll catch you better. Okay. There you go. I think these are two uh, new poems, I think. Poem on an April day, on an, on an April night. One of a rainy April, I sit here. The quiet moves me as the night, as uh, only the night moves along. Avril, one that Avril in Sarazota. The doctor of March has, has passed us has passed us like dark clouds. I sit inside for a sunny day in hopeful May. These are some, some oldies, but a, 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 a Libra fiddles a beast lying in Dover, the day prayer stood still. The air is impetuous as it was the air lying to near its whereabouts, the whereabouts of the air. Done the beast from 14 lines. I be in Clover in Dover, weak rhymes, the opera in, of, a, of, of a madness comedy is, is no kid. You can, you, you, you can hem and haw your way in Missouri, militars guffaw in the wine vats. I'm as mixed up as everyone else could have been, as if they had tried too hard, hard my, 
but my father stands in heaven. I wonder if laughter is contempt. Cancer is no kid to kid you. The broken music mirror. Times often I hurried on the bus, the ubiquitous 30 bus, the day the rain poured out of my father's umbrella. No time really to step out of, out of the traffic. Rain soaked, rain soaked. The day turned out to be sort of dark, sort of a little miserable. The miserable cold it is, stand easy, broken weather, clouds stay up in the sky. Blitz. Cleeg, the ego is tired and kind to trace a maiden on for size. Send a metaphor on its sudden, on its maiden voyage. The lapels are double breasted, big as big breasts, guys and dolls last all night. The, the metaphor. Disguise as a poem, a mere poem. Talks to the night, air, the music, and the fine air, the the gentle guitar, the sound lost as as a, as a blue insect night. Fourteen lines on a theme by Jack Spicer. A days like all days, the shoddy sun, the concealed moon, maybe it will shine tonight. The poem appears behind a bush. The poem has all the joy of a, of a wild rabbit. Rabbit, Elmer Fudd's, suppress the metaphor, every metaphor before it appears on the page, before it climbs between your legs. Someday a metaphor will be beneath the sea, hiding from where, we, where you cannot find it, no matter how hard you look. I am like an Aussie, a mad Aussie, chasing after what he thinks he wants. Chasing and choking and cooking and eating every metaphor he finds on the planet. Know that the, the, the planet is not the spice box of Earth. It is Elmer Fudd's garden. <laughs> Jack's eyes. At the North Beach Library, where there is a large picture of Jack Kerouac typing, typing in a teletype role. His eyes not tired, but expressionless. Of course, a Pisces is different. And go out and type again, anytime, any place, anywhere. <laughs> yes, type all of On the Road. His eyes are like his eyes are like this poem. They have everything and nothing to say. <laughs> the eyes of Tuesday. Well, the wailing welder, wonderful, the first hot day San Francisco has had in months. I lost my imagination has fled. There are people on the bus, but not of the bus. The doors open, the doors close. The clipper keeps and keeps and beeps. Maybe the bus has a flying cloud full of Swedish sailors and mermaids wrapped around the mast this day. My imagination become in the doldrums of inner space. Thank you, Mr. Owen. Okay. Thank you, Thank you very much. much. And this is your first time reading here, or is it? First time. Okay, first time, ladies and gentlemen! Okay, all right. Thank you back there. Okay, settle down, everyone. Oh, man, that's not fun. <laughs> This is called Follow the Raven. Can you hear me okay, Dan? Yes. Okay. I wrote it about 10 years ago. When I was walking along the beach, um, Ocean Beach, I saw a raven flying, so it inspired me to write this poem. It's called, okay, Follow the Raven to the ocean 
as it flaps its wings high, high above the atmosphere. But where will it go? Who knows? The question is, do I follow it? Or do I stay here on the outskirts, sitting on the shore, just a sedentary rock, waiting to turn into hot, molten lava, running down the ashen, sleeping volcano? Thank you. Thank you. Natalie Champion, a long-term friend of mine, school teacher, by the way, just so you know, as is someone else I know. Tommy Avak, holy Mecca! And Marjorie, and Daniel, and the cloud always shows the curves are brighter, Mr. Marjorie, I'm uh, Peter, and then Mr. Marjorie, I'm Peter. And uh, don't do this at home, we are professionals. Dancing, dancing, we're gonna be dancing, dan- Whoa, what the fuck just happened? A moment ago, the music was blasting at ear-shattering levels. The dance floor was packed. I was checking out that cute guy across the room, standing against the wall between the bar and the dance floor. Someone says, it's a raid. Guys are darting back and forth. I don't know where they're trying to go. Someone else says, the cops are here. I turn around and, yeah, there they are at the door, two of them. Oh shit, I'm only 19 years old, drinking age is 21. I've got my brother's expired driver's license. Him and I look a lot alike. In fact, most people think we're twins. He knows I use it to get into bars, but not gay bars. I put my drink down. I'm looking for somewhere where I can hide. I see a room. The door opens to a huge kitchen. There's an old guy at the sink washing glasses. I don't think he knows what's going on. He looks startled. I tell him, I try to explain to him that I'm a minor. He doesn't understand. So in my best choppy Italian, I tell him what's going on. Are you the me? Are you the me? Help me. Do vai, do vai, he says, go, go. Points to a door. It leads to a yard. There's a big wooden gate with a big wooden bolt. I lift it, I lift it. It, it leads to an alley. I hurry down the alley to the street. The police van is still parked in front of the bar. The cops are still inside. I cross the street and I stand there, waiting. A few moments later, the boys in blue lead these guys out of the bar and into the back of the van. I wanna run, but I can't. My body is frozen to the spot. It's like watching a train wreck. I wanna say something to the people going by. Hey, look what they're doing. We gotta do something, folks. But I know it wouldn't help. I'm thinking about a bar, a bar in New York, the Stonewall. There was a riot the night that they raided that bar. That's what we need, a riot. But I know it ain't gonna happen. People are just walking by as if nothing is happen, happening. The cops slam the back of the van closed and drive off. I stand there. I still can't move. It takes me a while to be able to walk back home. I'm pissed, but not as pissed as I am the next day when I open up the newspaper and there's an article about the raid, including the names and addresses of every guy who was arrested for not having proper ID. I'm not surprised. I'm just a faggot. My life doesn't matter to them just like the lives of those guys who are gonna lose their families, lose their jobs, maybe even of their apartments. Their lives don't matter. The cops will get their payoffs. The politicians will be able to boast about cracking down on vice like they did every election. And that's how it was in 1972 when America was great. Oh, yeah.
that is from a show that I'm doing now called The Old, Old Brown Jacket. That's one of the monologues, a series of monologues about life back then. I never gave you permission to baptize or confirm me or force me to experience my first taste of a dead Savior's body. It was round and white and flavorless and sometimes got stuck on the roof of my mouth unlike the bodies of men I would later come to know. I never gave you permission to send me to a school where self-righteous nuns and priests beat me and drained every drop of my blood, filling my veins with guilt. They told me if they had me when I was young, they'd have me for life. I never gave you permission to decide who I was, what I was going to be. You fenced me in, straightjacketed me, tied me to expectations that were never mine to claim, then disowned me when I couldn't live up to them. I never gave you permission to bring me into the world. No life might be better than one that ends in a hole eaten by worms, all my words and poems and songs forgotten, as I will be. Thank you. Come here, come here, brother. Thank you. Now, Margaret, is this your debut here? Well, that still counts as a debut. Come on, ladies and gentlemen, give her the roar up here. Woo-hoo! I don't want to hear it, ladies and gentlemen. Animal Noises County. Thank you. I'm going to start by reading a little poem from uh, my departed partner's book. His name is Whitman McGowan. Yes. So you have to, unfortunately, it's really hard for me to read his poems. So I want you to think of this poem as being read by someone who is very large, like six foot five with a deep voice. Just go closer to the mic, though. Get me close. Okay. There you I am a Western man. I am a Western man. I am a Californian. Bought and beat and bossed this land. Learned to grow things in this sand. I speak American. I am a Western man. Didn't know your Spanish, yet we made the haciendas vanish. Didn't learn your Indian lingo. Didn't ever have to buy jingo. No. Now we're halfway in the space age. We don't need a second language. Till the day the Martians come, won't have to learn Andromedan. I am a Californian. I am a Western man. I am an American. I talk American. White man spoke with fork and tongue, but it twarn't no bilingual one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's a little taste of Whitman. This is another one, actually. I haven't thought about this poem that I wrote. Oh, gosh, 22 years ago. Um, it's a pantoum for Whitman that just got published in a little online magazine called Ralph. I love that little wrinkle by your eye, how you turn to me at a reading, low, thrilling vibration in your throat, your telephone voice in my trembling ear. How you turn to me at a reading, whispering slyly in the back row, your telephone voice in my trembling ear, taking the poet's premise to extremes. Whispering slyly in the back row, you make an extravagant joke, taking the poet's premise to extremes. You say it is flatulent moonbeams. You make an extravagant joke, your profile stern in reddish bar light. You say it is flatulent moonbeams, and no one but me knows you're laughing. 
Your profile stern in reddish bar light, low thrilling vibration in your throat, and no one but me knows you're laughing. I love that little twinkle by your eye. And um, I'll close with a moon poem. A friend who makes poems with old folks, urging them to repeat his lines and dance with the words so their bodies can remember what they mean, tells me the moon in a poem by Li Po means home to the ancient Asian ladies he recited with today. No distant rock, no dusty footprint an astronaut traveled across space to step into. Moon means home. Silver light coming in a bedroom window, streaming across the poet's rumpled sheets, or falling onto the dreaming eyelids of an eight-year-old not yet poet who insists on open shades in the window over her bed to sleep in moonlight and defy her mother's claim the moon makes only nightmares. Because moon means home, its familiar presence over sleep, its homely, ever-repeating cycles, a reminder through any window that we are home here on Earth. Thank you. Good count is up. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for Dan Brady. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I am here now. Am I playing okay? Am I looking right? You're jumping off the very top. Yeah, you just, uh, just, just ran. There you go. That's probably. Awesome. All right. How are we this evening? Some of them. So, um, humorous or serious? Humorous. All right. Sorry, with humorous. This is from a prompt, and the prompt was about manners, and so this this title piece is titled. <clears throat> Let me move this back here. Can you hold that for just a moment, please? Absolutely. Thank you. So you're such, such a kind person. Can you stop that? Because that's that's that was not mine. Man, man, man. All right. Manners to mind. There are uh, 19 of them, just so you know. Number one. <clears throat> Mainly, if you are going to eat anyone's child. Disguise it in a rich stew and never, never serve the leftovers to any of their relations, no matter how distant it's not done. Two, when calling names, always criticize and correct the other's grammar. It refines the mind, sharpens the wit, and heightens many effects, and can serve to explosively enrage the target of your ire. Next, remember, no matter how much fun rage is, there is always the chance you'll lose control, and so say, or worse yet, do something that leaves inescapable, incriminating evidence which speaks for itself. Bodies, for example. <laughs> Number four, when being blamed or, or, uh, or accused, Obfuscate as needed, deny at all cost, or start a new fight if those options fail. Remember, distraction, misdirection, and incoherence are reasonable tactics and that the end always justifies the means. Oh. Number five, one of my favorites, if you must pass gas, surreptitiously move at flank speed to a distant point or corner of the room. <laughs> Vent and quickly but unobtrusively maneuver to safety, letting someone else call it. Six, never grope under the table at dinner time. The proper time is with dessert. Seven, don't finger your cousins when your uncle hasn't had any. Eight, puking or projectile vomiting is rarely acceptable, but when you do, make sure someone you detest or who is detestable gets soaked but good. 
Nine, neither uncle nor aunt should put their hands down your pants. <laughs> 10. When stealing the family silver, implicate any morally suspect cuckold. <clears throat> 11. Sharp truth is best done when it produces public humiliation, shame, or better yet, ostracism. You get extra points only if your profits are indirect and make sure that grandma gets her 10%. 12. Mayhem before murder, just as sex before identification theft. Remember, they order of that. 13, letting go is good, especially if it's the only grip someone has on a misspent life. Thank you. 14, never pass up a good opportunity to misdirect, mislead, or manhandle. 15, beauty is only skin deep, but revenge is forever. 16, uh, chance favors the highly trained and well-armed over the unwary. Yikes. Number 17, sneaking is a life skill, so is profitable snitching. 18, implications leading to dishonor are all the sweeter if they are wrong. And number 19, all is fair in love and war and marriage, divorce, friendship, the workplace, or when implicating the witless or innocent points depending upon how well you serve your own greedy advantage. There you go. Manners to mind. And for the for the mere more and for the mere and for the more erudite amongst you. From Kabir to Kabir and everything in between. Okay, so this is a completely different topic. This is serious. My heart, oh my friends, is on fire with a happiness so very, very great. It's each and every fiber is vibrant, gloriously radiant, dazzling. It is so light, buoyed beyond by such joy as is never found by the possession of common treasure, wants, or passion. The precious heart is never beguiled by such trinkets, nor can its love be overthrown. It knows what all beggars do. If you keep your life in your own hands, then wherever you go, even in common attire with simple shoes, you'll have your arts to proffer, and so will you please exceedingly well those whom you find along the way, and in so doing, also find your estate in being yourself, whenever, wherever. And just as simple folk do, it leads life to being, knows that its meaning comes from giving life meaning, as they say, whereby one may then live with easy grace from moment to eternity. We all know the body becomes dust, and so all vanity is at best temporal. Why then wish for, hope for, fear for of what was or may yet be? Dwell then in the vast immediate intimacy of its love, and so be contented with yourself as you are as it is one thing more. Listen as if a saintly chorale were to sound at any moment, and know you will meet the divine at any moment. Oh! Well, watch out for that divine guy. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This at home. No. Oh, yeah, Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, come on, come on. Come on to step right up, folks. Go to grab yourself a front row seat before they're gone and they're going fast. You don't want to miss this. It's time for another exciting installment of the Clyde Always, always Show. show. We are always clever, always handsome, always charming host, Clyde Always, and I ain't no common carnival worker. I am the, the Bard of the Lower Hay. And this is the tale of Larry's special. Once upon a time, in a greasy little diner, there worked a greasy line cook named Larry. And Larry was incompetent. Larry's sunny side ups came out cloudy side down. 
His preferred method of warming dinner rolls was to sit on them. Yeesh. Now, in the back of this diner was a walk-in refrigerator box to which Larry would often, in a walk-in. Well, one day, the refrigerator, it spoke to Larry. Larry was amazed. Amazing, said Larry. It told him a strange recipe. And Larry jotted down said recipe using instead of a pen a squirt bottle of ketchup. Then he promptly prepared this new dish, and all the customers up front they thought it smelled kind of good. That smells kind of good, the customers all said. So day after day, the refrigerator made sure to tell Larry a new special, and Larry made sure to have plenty of ketchup on hand. <laughs> Business began to increase and increased so rapidly that Larry had to hire a manager, and the manager's name was Mr. Mustache, and yes, Mr. Mustache was clean-shaven. <laughs> now, as his first order of business, Mr. Mustache decided they had to renovate the diner. No skin off my nose, said Larry. The next day, Larry ran face-first right into a brand-new walk-in refrigerator box. What the fuck, Larry said to Mr. Mustache. Well, the old one was all plastered in ketchup stains, Mr. Mustache said to Larry. Two weeks later, the diner mysteriously burned to the ground, and Mr. Mustache, not so mysteriously, ran off with all the insurance money. On a happier note, are you okay? Okay, good. <laughs> Holy shit. On a happier note, Larry has recently been appointed branch manager at your local Department of Motor Vehicles. The oh, end. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. I've got a musical interview for you. And if I fuck it up, I've got the lyrics right here in my pocket, but you, well, you're all rooting for me, right? Here we go. Yeah. Conducts a symphony. This life on the planet, I wonder now, can it get any more noisy or loud? Let's take us a listen to that and to this and tune into the sounds of the crowd. The shouts and the whispers, the mutterers, lispers, their jaws are all flapping away. Now everyone's talking or more like they're squawking, guess no one's got nothing to say. Debaters debating, berators berating, indignantly blathering on. When one of them stutters, the other one utters, you get the hell off of my lawn. There's gaggles of girlies like chittering squirrelies, crescendos of giggles and squeaks. It's always a toss up of rumors and gossip, most often resulting in shrieks. Chihuahua are yapping, Rottweilers snapping, retrievers and terriers bark. No human should meddle, as loudly they settle. Just who is the king of the park? The crickets are pricking, the tickets are t ah, the ticks are all ticking, the chickadee's tripping a song. When he's due for a poke and the froggy starts croaking, it sounds like he's coming on strong. The donkey's all braying, the horse is all neighing, so we someone's calling this out. You can hear the cut you and wait, what's all that mooing shit? Somebody's tipping the cow. Now, rightly we wonder, could that have been thunder along with the rustling breeze, then noses we cover, as soon we discover was somebody cutting the cheese. Violas and cellos, guitar toting fellows, all strumming at this string and that. They're sadly applauded with something gone rotted, a gooey tomatoey splat. Pro secco is popping, stilettos to the clopper, Ferraris are revved up, and then they're having a rumble, and now we all grumble. There go the my Italians again. They're breaking and racking, the cue ball is cracking, they're playing a song on the juke. The barmaid's convection is loudly he's Wretched old rummy, he's hacking up puke. The carpenter's nailing, the backhoe is wailing, the jackhammer's pounding the dirt while flexing their gristle. The workers all whistle at anything wearing a skirt. The geezers are snoring, the lions are roaring, the girders they bend with a groan. The orcas are singing, now something is ringing, won't somebody answer that phone? Now sirens are blaring, and dynamite's tearing, there's fighters just rocketing past. A rocket will show up, the great pack of toe of the boom of a nuclear blast. From Baghdad to Boise, the world is so noisy, with sounds overfloweth our cup. Some real peace and quiet, it won't hurt to try it. So everyone shut the fuck up. <laughs> Boom. Thanks everybody, tune in next time for that Get nervous, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. The cursive writer shall now come forth again. Like I said, he was the uh, the keynote of the evening. Uh, now he is returning to do his own business, as we like to call it.
And then we have, uh, looks like we have Peter, then our teacher. Just so you know, I keep that in check because I might reverse myself later on and you'll say, what the hell happened? Yeah, well, you should have told me. I might say that anyway. It's his fault. It's always his fault. Who's fault? Anybody's, not mine. Uh, no American Indians. Russell Main speaks eloquently how the citizens of USA are now the new Indians. It's true, USA doesn't want its citizens to notice, so it's done it slowly until, as usual, it's too late. Practicing successfully only to a degree on indigenous people everywhere, then countries. USA is well versed in genocide, dispossessing homelessness. They did it here in USA to the Indian. Now they're doing it to you. <clears throat> uh, check the date. I've said in another piece that in 1978, a young walker on the longest walk to bring attention to the further dispossessing of Indian rights, lands, walking for his, ours, and future generations, as well as his enemies, said, if they can do this to us, what they are doing and is being done, they can do it to you as well. We never heard him, and now we know it is happening. Your country is experiencing rape. Are, it's occurring all around you, you can't see it. The dumbing down of each generation who knows less with each passing generation until no one knows shit but tech shit, which is, if you were to disappear, won't help you survive. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you that day today and your tech shit still works. Get this on tape. Our rights are disappearing, too busy to notice, is unforgivable for what we've said and for when we've said nothing. USA knows most citizens don't, that we all live under Indian law. It's called the Constitution. We live under the Iroquois Confederation of the Six Nations Law. USA adopted but left out women, the matriarchal societies where no white Christian men were going to have women tell them what to do. One of the leaders of the Confederation is said to have said when USA was founded, we saw the great light go on, but soon after we saw that great light dim. And we, the citizens, did not see the vape. You have no privacy just like the res. You stole Indian land now as the same lands are now being stolen from you. The airwaves are the people's. You own them, but somewhere in Noosa, your government sold you out to the corporate media, who now charges you for using what's yours instead of putting what that putting that in, into the coffers of the people for the people. Someone should grab you by the nape. You have no community unless you call Walmart, Whole Foods, Amazon family communities. Yes, citizens of USA, you are the truly the new Indian gape. Tours. In Europe, there are Holocaust museums, tours, places to remember the murder of humans because of who they were and are in beliefs. They also preserve ancient sacred sites, even though they're not their relatives to honor. In USA, we destroy memory for profit. Better to make money than to remember our Holocaust, let alone give tours for reconciliation, humor, respect. In USA, we don't respect except our lies. 
We built monuments in praise of our genocidal empire, from Confederate statues to the murders of native people across Usa. Though there are signs that these edifices will not stand, does not mean the intent in the human heart will be as grand. No, in Usa, our tours will be to show the world the destruction of our sacred ancient sites, wiping out as much as the native slave. And while they're at it, women and gay history as well. This is, after all, about men, men, men. Usa always talks about the founding fathers. Where are the founding mothers, or did Usa men give virgin births? Now that would be a tour. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to the cursive writer. These are my time. Give him a round of applause, please. Give this man a round of applause. An ancient writer of long note merit and walk on through. Ancient. 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 May 23rd. Yeah, and I like the hat, by the way. Thank you. Right. Mark Olmstead will be here, too. So oh! There'll be four Birthstone poets in yes. one room. Yes, in one room. I know. At the same time. At the same time. And no scrabbly. No scrabbly. Yeah. Same mind. Thank you. It's called Solstice. My wife and I have an agreement not to talk about work at home. But if we do and then regret it, I might have to walk out to the front yard and look for stars. If it's too dark to go far, then I'll just stand and breathe in the evening away from everywhere. There might be the smell of skunk the rustle of something in the brush by the bamboo where last week I saw turkeys fucking in violent wing flapping hops. <laughs> Voices raise in laughter across the way. Dusk birds coo. Bats rustle into the early night sky, swooping up from their canvas home like black pinstrokes across the last light of day. Nice. Thank you. Yeah. Wasn't about the last solstice. In case you were wondering. Well, yeah. Just which solstice? <clears throat> no one's beat samsara. You just can't win versus that wheel of birth and death. Yeah. When you have women, mojo and looks, something else will be missing. Your teeth haven't all been accounted for now, and your ex is asking for some help digging out her car. And there's poverty ahead. And in the rear, those trees you felled with the toy hatchet dad bought at Woolworths just won't go away. Too many branches poke at you like the burrs your cat leaves in your clean underwear drawer that scratch, reminding you, you thought you once had it all. <laughs> Squirrels had less nuts. Your hair grew fountains of broken hearts. You drove Miss Luxury around in her limo while she let it rain green paper everywhere, and each white powder was golden on the other side of dawn. You wanted more, took up divination for fun and profit, but went broke investing in yesterdays that no longer paid the long shot odds. So-called experts like 
dad went broke on long before you had the scratch or the itch to get rid of. TV keeps the lid on. TV keeps the lid on gruesome murder. Serial killers in limousines always get caught. The victims are beautiful. The police are beautiful. The fake carnage, beautiful for our entertainment. TV keeps the lid on my head from fizzing off like advertised sugar water, exploding like a jet mirage. <clears throat> Fourth of July air show trick. I keep the anger in. I don't blow up. I don't shout. I don't throw knives anymore. <laughs> Even for fun. TV keeps the hours safe when I'm alone. Keeps the distance safe from room to room. Adjust the volume, the tint, the blurry edges slap down in front of the reporters and FBI profilers with manicured three-day beards. <laughs> TV keeps the lid on my ears from ringing, the hat on my head near the door instead of kicking up the wind on a clear mountain road at night. I need the lid on. I need TV like a tip tap a hole in my logic, a punch to the gut instead of push-ups, and a multiracial girl I should be dating right now because I need the experience. Oh, TV keeps me awake, it keeps me sane, keeps me hopeful, keeps the news happy when it should be. Properly concerned when it's snowing somewhere and doctors walk city streets with stethoscopes looking for future osteoporosis. Mm. <laughs> I get new teeth, new drugs, new women, new cars with rims of psychic children spinning the news, whichever way works. I get TV across the spectrum, Hawaiian music, clenching jaws, pointed guns, plastic surgery and biker bums, noble than the Prince of Danes. TV keeps the lid on my time, my stomach, cock, marriage. Though we do fight over the amount of hours I spend watching. I can never be happy as long as TV exists. TV's a suck hole. Yawning asphalt. Sepia tone, lattice fenced apple trees. I'll never know the bliss of the dying cop's remorse. I'll never know the acquitted stripper's migraine relief or the death of mucus. Did you know you could take a second antidepressant to help your antidepressant work better? <laughs> so you can smile like sunshine in 30 seconds? Did you know a man could have five girlfriends worship him if he uses a mouth freshener five times stronger than before. <laughs> Makes sense. TV isn't keeping a lid on anything. Every emotion is real. Every storyline is mysterious until the sixth act of a one-hour drama, until the sitcom stars all fall down, until the reality show becomes real, the clock winding down on the game the race, the contest, and weather report. TV is about dreams, about the bright lights and hopeful ambitions of plucky cell phone salesmen who bring coffee to fire dogs and talking toothbrushes. TV keeps a lid on tongue plaque diabetes. TV keeps a lid on airborne pay-per-view fights, pornography, and declining birth rates in first world countries. TV keeps a lid on my angst, my rage at gravestones of invisible strangers, and songs I never sung. TV keeps a lid on the American flag, test signals, those lonely men mourning over their lost dreamland, their lost continent of imagined wealth, stolen by the immigrants, they've forgotten were once then.
Thank you. Peter Martin.